Well, welcome everybody. Uh, first, I'm gonna say a few words about the Society and the Journal and then, then get right on to introduce our two outstanding speakers for today. So this uh, webinar series is being put on by the Society of Experimental Biology and Medicine and the journal Experimental Biology and Medicine. And the Society is an international uh, uh, set of researchers uh, working on biomedical research that's very interested in interdisciplinary research and the development of a future generation of researchers. Uh, there's many perks to being a member of the society. The two top ones on the screen relate to the journal. You get annual subscription to the journal, but you also uh, do are not charged page charges uh, for articles in the journal if you're a first or corresponding author and an SCBM member. And the membership rates are very low, as you can see below especially low for students that it's free for students who want to join the society. So next slide, please, Jess. Uh, both the society and its journal, Experimental Biology and Medicine, were established well over 100 years ago in 1903. We have 20 different scientific categories that are at the crossroads of experimental biology and medicine. With the, within the entire translational range, uh, T0 to T4. We have journal offices on five different continents. Uh, I'm the editor in chief in the United States, but we also have global editors in Taiwan, Great Britain, Brazil, and Ghana. We've got an international uh, editorial board with 20 associate editors and over 180 editorial board members. And the current impact factor for two years is greater than 3.1. Can I have the next slide, please? So another thing that the Society and the Journal does is we uh, have an international experimental biology and medicine conference uh, in October uh, of each year. And we're about to do our eighth which will be October 8th to 10th. And it's going to be in Memphis, Tennessee, which is where I live and the two speakers for today uh, live. And the subject of the conference for this coming year is regenerative medicine. If any of you are interested in that subject, uh, please take a look at the website and join us. Next slide, please. So we have two leaders speaking to us today and, and friends from, from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, who work in the area of sickle cell disease. And I'm going to introduce both of them uh, at this time. And the first speaker will be uh, Kenetaga. He's gonna be talking to us about the glomerulopathy of sickle cell disease. Um, he is the Plough Foundation Endowed Chair in Sickle Cell Disease at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. He's the inaugural director of the Center for Sickle Cell Disease Research at UTHSC. And he's been a leader in the area of development of drug therapies for sickle cell disease, including some new FDA approved drugs for this purpose. Uh, Dr. Jane Hankins is from St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Uh, she's going to be talking to us today about mobile health for patients with sickle cell disease to improve medical adherence. Uh, Jane is an associate member of the St. Jude faculty within the outstanding hematology department. Uh, she has broad ranging interests that cover new therapeutic approaches in sickle cell disease, outcomes research, specifically transition from childhood to adult care. And she's also interested in clinical and genetic factors in sickle cell disease progression. And so with that introduction, I would like to first hand this over to Kenetaga and his talk will be followed by a talk by Jane Hankins. 
Thank you so much, Steve, um, for the kind introduction. I'll try and see if I can share my screen. You see the right screen? Just want to make sure. Okay, all right, good. Thank you so much, Steve, for the kind introduction. Um, so good afternoon to all. Uh, so today I'm going to provide uh, an overview of the glomerulopathy of sickle cell disease and highlight some of the work that we've done in this area. So these are my disclosures uh, with regards to research funding and um, other conflicts. So as part of this talk today, so um, what I plan to do is to very briefly um, highlight the spectrum of renal complications in patients with sickle cell disease. And again, very briefly discuss the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease related glomerulopathy. Uh, I'll also uh, briefly discuss the natural history of uh, kidney disease in uh, these patients and mention some biomarkers uh, of uh, sickle cell disease related glomerulopathy. I'll end by um, uh, discussing uh, treatments and some of the work we've done in this area and then provide some um, uh, future direction. So as you know, uh, sickle cell disease is an inherited uh, blood disorder that's associated with a variety of acute illnesses and progressive organ dysfunction. Uh, so this is a blood smear of, of the patient with sickle cell disease as uh, shown with characteristic sickle forms. I uh, also see a target red cell here, I'm sorry, a nucleated red cell here and some target uh, forms as well. Um, sickle cell disease results in uh, a variety of kidney abnormalities, which occur along the entire length of the uh, nephron. And so patients with sickle cell disease can experience a variety of complications, including distal and proximal tubular abnormalities. Uh, they can have uh, a variety of hemodynamic changes, including increased effective renal plasma flow. They can have increased glomerular filtration rates uh, that's referred to as hyperfiltration. And because the effective renal plasma flow um, much exceeds the increase in GFR, and these patients have, they have increased fluid pressure fraction. Uh, they can have a variety of uh, causes uh, for, uh, they can have hematuria that uh, occurs from a variety of causes, uh, including papillary necrosis. Uh, sickle cell patients are at risk for having acute kidney injury. Uh, they can have this glomerulopathy of sickle cell disease, which manifests as albuminuria, which is the presence of protein in the urine or albumin in the urine. And these patients can also have progressive declines in their glomerular filtration rates, which are subsequently referred to as GFR. Finally, patients with sickle cell disease, as well as individuals who have sickle cell trait, are at risk for developing these complications called renal medullary carcinoma. Uh, so it's actually much more common in individuals who have sickle cell trait, but it has also been described in sickle cell disease. So um, as the rate of um, um, Oxygen consumption by the kidney is very high. Uh, these patients who have sickle cell disease, in patients who have sickle cell disease, uh, the kidney is particularly sensitive to hypoxia. And uh, with the presence of acidosis, hypertonicity, and hypoxia in the renal medulla, uh, all these factors favoring, favoring um, polymerization of sickle hemoglobin, many of these changes can um, increase the risk of polymerization of sickle hemoglobin and result in a variety of changes. So blood uh, does traverse the slow-moving vasa recta system uh, in the medulla. Uh, and uh, because of the hypertonic or hyperosmolar environment that's present uh, in the uh, medulla, this can enhance the dehydration of the sickle red blood cells and increase the risk for polymerization of sickle hemoglobin. And this can result in vasoclusive complications and medullary microinfarction. So this uh, very busy slide, um, is taken from one of our previous publications and it just highlights the prevalence of albuminuria in patients who have sickle cell disease. So albuminuria and sickle cell disease is very common. Um, and, and this is a very busy table, so I don't expect to look at the whole thing. Uh, but just to summarize what we found, uh, uh, what we showed in our review is that um, in patients who have sickle cell disease, the prevalence of albuminuria in children uh, up to the age of 21 could be as high as 26%. And in older patients, uh, the prevalence of albuminuria could be as high as 68%. So it's a very common complication uh, in patients who have sickle cell disease. 
Um, so with regards to the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease, um, this is not completely defined at this time, but we think the pathophysiology is multifactorial. Uh, so for one, um, worsening hypoxia, uh, which uh, follows reduced medullary blood flow, um, results in, in localized prostaglandin secretion, which results in marked vasodilation. And this results in increased effective renal plasma flow and increased GFR uh, in patients who have sickle cell disease uh, in the um, kidneys. And hyperfiltration um, appears to be a precursor of albuminuria in patients who have sickle cell disease and um, um, may be an important contributor to the pathology of glomerulopathy in these patients. Other contributors to uh, the um, problem, this glomerular problem in patients with sickle cell disease include increased oxidative stress uh, that's present in the kidneys. Uh, these patients also have findings that suggest increased glomerular hypertension. Uh, they also have um, evidence of endothelial dysfunction, which we think contributes to some of the problems that they have with regards to their kidney disease. And finally, um, some of the drugs that are used to treat patients, including um, opioid analgesics and non steroidal analgesics, uh, non-steroidal and anti-inflammatory uh, drugs may contribute to the pathology of kidney disease in patients with sickle cell disease. Um, so it is well recognized that endothelial function uh, in sickle cell disease is impaired. So, and this can be assessed in a variety of ways. It can be assessed uh, by measuring flow mediated dilation, um, uh, which uh, assesses um, the dilation of the blood vessels following reactive hyperemia, or can be assessed invasively. Um, so, although this is well documented in sickle cell disease, its contribution to disease pathology is not very well defined. So, we previously evaluated the association of albuminuria with endothelial function assessed by fluid mediated dilation of the brachial artery following reactive hyperemia. So this is the technique here. So patients get this uh, assessment uh, using this fluid mediated dilated, uh, dilation uh, of the brachial artery technique. So what we found was that in this pilot study of sickle cell patients who had varying degrees of albuminuria, so some with normal albuminuria and others with increased albuminuria, uh, we found that urine albumin creatinine ratio is significantly and inversely correlated uh, with uh, flow mediated dilation, so that endothelial dysfunction was associated with the presence of albuminuria in this patient. Um, next, I'll go to the um, natural history of sickle cell disease. So there is increasing evidence that the uh, glomerulopathy of sickle cell disease is progressive. Um, so um, there's evidence that the initial hyperfiltration that these patients have can lead to development of albuminuria and subsequent progressive decline in the estimated GFR. And this declines progressively until patients end up having uh, kidney failure and require renal replacement therapies. So a variety of um, uh, longitudinal studies uh, have reported uh, that kidney function declines over time. Uh, so this first study is uh, a study by Galin Powers and her colleagues from many years ago. Uh, this was a 25 year, 25 year prospective cohort study of children with sickle cell disease, mainly patients with homozygous sickle cell disease and some with SC disease. And what they found was that over the period of follow-up, 4.2% of uh, SS patients and 2.4% of SC patients developed chronic renal failure. Uh, a more recent single center retrospective study, which was conducted here in uh, Memphis by uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Pat Adam Graves and some of our colleagues, uh, showed uh, that the prevalence of chronic kidney disease increase from 28.6% to about 42% after five years of follow-up. Uh, so you will notice that the uh, rates were actually quite different here. And I think uh, with, I think that the difference in the prevalence of chronic kidney disease is related to how CKD was de defined in both cohorts. So they're defined in different ways. And uh, further, uh, the second study from the Memphis group looked at adult patients, whereas the study from Darlene Powers looked at children. So in adult patients, they had more obvious declines in their kidney function. So using a uh, retrospective longitudinal uh, patient cohort uh, from when I was at UNC in Chapel Hill, we evaluated um, the rate of decline in kidney function in adults with sickle cell disease adjusted for age and for sex. And so um, we evaluated 427 patients, 331 of whom had at least two measurements of um, uh, of their estimated GFR with a median follow-up of about, about four years. And so what we found in this group was that the rate of decline in kidney function over time in patients who had severe sickle cell disease, that's 
uh, hemoglobin SS and sickle beta zero thalassemia was uh, 2.05 mLs per minute uh, per year. Um, and uh, this uh, rate that we found, rate of decline we found is higher than what's reported for the general African American population, which is about 1.27 mLs per minute per 1.7 liters squared per year. Uh, in our cohort, we found that uh, patients who had presence of albuminuria, who had presence of proteinuria, uh, had even more, even faster declines in their kidney function uh, with a rate of decline of up to 3.51 mLs per minute per year. And patients who had histories of stroke also had even fast, had faster declines as well compared to the general sickle cell disease population. More recently, uh, we performed a pooled analysis uh, of uh, patients um, with sickle cell disease from four institutions. So UNC, uh, UPHSC, St. Jude, and uh, from um, University of Illinois at Chicago and Duke. And uh, we found uh, that in this full population of about 600 patients with sickle cell disease who were followed for a median of 5.3 years, uh, the change in GFR over time uh, was faster than, what's, yeah, faster than what's described in the general population with an estimated decline rate of uh, 2.36 mLs. Uh, per minute by 1.73 meters per second. Uh, again, supporting the fact that patients with sickle cell disease have uh, faster declines in their kidney function over time compared to um, the general population. So next, uh, we looked at um, uh, factors that are associated with the declines in EGFR in patients with sickle cell disease over time uh, using the cohort that we evaluated uh, from uh, UNC. Uh, again, uh, these uh, variables were adjusted for age and for sex. And so we evaluated uh, uh, first uh, the patients who had severe sickle cell disease defined as patients with hemoglobin SS and sickle beta zero thalassemia and found that um, uh, significant associations uh, with hemoglobin. So patients who had lower hemoglobin had more rapid decline. Also found significant associations with uh, ferritin uh, as well as with um, baseline EGFR. So patients who had uh, lower baseline GFRs had more rapid decline in their uh, kidney function. I also found uh, uh, associations with presence of proteinuria, as well as with a uh, history of stroke. When we looked at patients who have um, milder disease genotype, so that's hemoglobin SC disease and sickle beta plus thalassemia, we found associations with lactate dehydrogenase levels uh, and with traditional risk factors, including systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, and history of diabetes. Um, we next performed a multivariable analysis, and uh, in the severe uh, genotype uh, category, uh, we found that only baseline hemoglobin was associated with EGFR change over time, but did not find any relationship, uh, any significant um, factor, any factor that associated with um, uh, such decline in the uh, milder genotype. All right, so um, patients who have sickle cell disease and have kidney disease have a high risk of dying. So that's well described. So kidney disease at baseline is associated with increased risk of mortality in sickle cell disease. And so we and others have shown that. So this uh, figure uh, just shows uh, increased mortality uh, for patients who have kidney disease. And in this um, figure, we have actually categorized EGFR uh, based on uh, a variety of um, strata. So we classified, we divided the uh, patients into different groups, patients who had normal GFR based on an EGFR of greater than 130 mLs per minute, or patients who had values of between 90 and 129, uh, or between um, um, 60 and 89, or patients who had EGFR values of less than 60. And as you can see, there was a relationship between uh, mortality and uh, decreased EGFR values. So patients who had EGFR values of less than 60, we're, partic we're at particularly high risk of, of, of dying. Um, next, we looked at the relationship between um, rapid decline in kidney function and mortality. So rapid decline in kidney function can be defined in a variety of ways. And, and um, there are two ways to define it, either based on decline in EGFR of greater than three mLs per minute per year, or based on the declines of greater than five mLs per minute per 1.73 meters uh, per year. And when we used uh, either classification, we found that patients who had rapid decline compared to those who do not have a rapid decline have increased mortality. 
So this figure shows um, um, comparison of the mortality in patients with um, rapid decline compared to those who did not have rapid decline. And we see a significant association with mortality uh, in this uh, group of patients. And again, when we use a threshold of greater than five ml uh, per minute per 1.7 meters per second per year, I also found increased mortality, suggesting that regardless of the threshold that we use to define rapid decline, uh, patients uh, with sickle cell disease have increased mortality if they do have rapid decline in kidney function. Uh, so next, I'm going to talk about a couple of biomarkers that we are looking at. So we know that kidney disease is bad uh, in sickle cell disease, like in other disease conditions. And um, so clinically, we actually evaluate for early kidney disease using um, assessments of albuminuria. So assessing for presence of microalbumin creatinine ratios. Uh, but we also know that uh, this actually occurs when patients already have significant kidney disease. And so we and others are interested in developing or identifying biomarkers that may identify patients even earlier before, possibly before they develop uh, overt kidney disease. And so in a, a pilot study that we conducted, uh, we evaluated the association of a variety of biomarkers with uh, urine albumin creatinine ratio. And so what we found in our study was that uh, albumin creatinine ratio was significantly associated uh, with um, uh, VEGF, as well as with uh, uh, endothelin one. Uh, this was um, marginally significant, it's a trend here. We also found significant relationships with plasma hemoglobin. So patients who have high levels of free plasma hemoglobin had higher likelihood of having um, albumin. Um, we performed a multivariable analysis uh, in this um, um, uh, population and found significant positive associations between um, endothelin one uh, and albuminuria, as well as negative associations with VEGF, as well as with um, uh, soluble S-split-1. Uh, so the finding of uh, the relationship between S-split-1 and albuminuria in our multivariable analysis was somewhat surprising. So we have actually seen that in our previous study, uh, but the direction was actually not what we expected. Uh, so what we have reported previously is that increased levels of S-split-1 uh, are associated with presence of albuminuria in patients with sickle cell disease. Um, next, using the same uh, patient um, cohort, uh, we evaluated, um, we explored um, metabolic profiles in patients with sickle cell disease who had varying degrees of albuminuria, so patients with and without albuminuria. And so uh, this OPLSDS um, plot uh, actually separates out patients uh, who have albuminuria versus those who do not have albuminuria. So, uh, the blue represents the cases of albuminuria, while those uh, who do not are in um, green or red, and a little bit colorblind, so but different colors. Um, and so what we did find uh, was that we were able to identify six metabolites um, uh, that suggest that were that linked with patients who had albuminuria. And so these were um, betaine, proline, dalmethylamine, glutamate, uh, leucine, and lysine. Uh, so this was an exploratory study because it was a very small study. Um, so the p-values used for this study was 0 0.1 as opposed to the traditional 0 .05, 0 0.05. And we did not correct for any multiple testing. But this gave us some sense um, as to metabolites that might be linked to the presence of um, albuminuria and patients with sickle cell disease. I would add that we are doing a much bigger study, a multi-center study, uh, which, in which we hope to confirm these findings and, ex and uh, uh, extend our findings as well. Uh, we've also looked at the relationship between nephrine and albuminuria in patients with sickle cell disease. So nephrine uh, is a split diaphragm protein that provides architectural support to podocytes. So podocytes are epithelial cells that are present in glomerular uh, cells. Um, and so uh, there's lots of evidence that nephrine shedding is a marker of glomerular specific kidney damage. And mouse models suggest that um, shedding of nephrine uh, occurs before the, the mice actually develop albuminuria. And so in our study, we evaluated the predictive capacity of urinary nephrine for the presence of albuminuria in patients with sickle cell disease. And so what we found was that um, the um, nephrine creatinine ratio was highly predictive for presence of albuminuria. Uh, and um, the um, AUC uh, uh, in our um, ROC curve uh, was 0 0.9, uh, so it was highly predictive. Uh, we also found that uh, when we use a nephrine creatinine ratio cut point of uh, uh, above the 50th percentile, uh, it was actually very sensitive 
for presence with abnormal in this uh, in this patient population. So what we are trying to do now is to see if um, we can um, prove or uh, validate the fact that patients with sickle cell disease who are at risk for developing kidney disease, that they can develop nephrinuria even before they develop albuminuria. So those studies are ongoing right now. So hopefully uh, we'll present our data uh, in, the, in the near future. So how do we treat um, um, kidney disease in patients with sickle cell disease? So there are only very few treatments that are available at this time. Um, the standard of care is to use um, drugs called ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers uh, for patients who have overt albuminuria. Uh, so these patients are, are, are treated with this medication for standard of care. Uh, in addition, hydroxyurea has been sh um, shown to be beneficial in a variety of cross-sectional studies and open-level studies. So although these medications, ACE inhibitors and ARBs, as well as hydroxyurea may be used uh, to treat these patients, I would add that there are no large studies or no adequately controlled long-term studies uh, showing that these medications slow the rate of decline in kidney function in patients with sickle cell disease. And so um, the data we have at this point are just based on open-label studies or small or poorly controlled studies. Um, so others are planning to do uh, bigger studies and well-controlled studies. Uh, and so uh, hopefully we'll have definitive answers uh, soon. Uh, there's been several small studies of promising agents in sickle cell disease, uh, some of which we have done ourselves. And um, I'll kind of illustrate one of those uh, in the next slide. And there are also a variety of ongoing um, planned studies uh, in this area. So we have an interest in the development of new therapies in sickle cell disease. And so working with my collaborator, David Archer, who's at Emory University, uh, we evaluated the effect of etovastatin uh, uh, in sickle cell necropathy. And so David is a basic scientist, and so he tested etovastatin in mice, and I tested etovastatin in, in patients with sickle cell disease. And so um, what uh, we did uh, in this initial study in sickle mice was that uh, the mice were treated with etovastatin at 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight uh, for eight weeks. Um, and what we found uh, is that in this sickle cell mice, uh, we found that treatment of these mice with etovastatin uh, resulted in significant decrease in albuminuria compared to patient, the mice uh, that got uh, just vehicle. And the levels actually decreased to levels seen in AA mice. Um, in addition, um, the urine volumes were also significantly decreased following treatment with etovastatin compared to um, mice that just got vehicle and did not get active treatment. Uh, in addition, um, treatment with etovastatin resulted in um, increased improvement of the urine concentrating defect that's known to be present in, in mice with sickle cell disease. So when the mice were treated with etovastatin, the urine osmolality actually increased, it improved compared to mice that got vehicle. And the GFR or glomerular filtration rate increased, so it actually improved in mice that got active treatment compared to those that got um, vehicle. Finally, um, the um, uh, treatment with uh, etovastatin also resulted in decreased levels of KIM1. So KIM is um, kidney in, urine kidney injury molecule one, which is a marker of tubular uh, damage, tubular injury. And so they had decreased levels compared to uh, mice that just got vehicle. And there was a trend towards a decrease in levels of um, um, urine nephrine um, and, and um, NGAR. Uh, when uh, we looked at the level of plasma soluble VCAM, um, one, which is a marker of endothelial injury, found that treatment with etovastatin also re resulted in decreased levels compared to mice that got treated. Uh, so these findings were also were actually quite impressive and we're quite pleased with the findings. And so we conducted parallel studies. So as we're doing the studies in mice, we're conducting studies in patients with sickle cell disease. And so we performed this um, single center randomized placebo controlled um, crossover study uh, in patients with sickle cell disease. Uh, we're evaluating the effect of equivastatin on endothelial function assessed uh, by um, fluid dilation or FMD, as well as albuminuria. Unfortunately, we did not see any significant um, effects of equivastatin on these measures, uh, in large part because the study was actually quite small, and so I may not have been adequately powered uh, to uh, detect any findings. On top of that, the patients only got, only got treatment for uh, six weeks, which may not have been long enough for us to see uh, desired findings. Uh, what we did see though that is somewhat encouraging 
uh, is the fact that in um, uh, patients who uh, receive a tova statin compared to those who got placebo, there was a trend towards decreasing endothelin one levels. And that was very interesting because we, there's increasing evidence that endothelin one plays a role in sickle cell disease related glomerulopathy. And so perhaps by decreasing endothelin one, we might be able to see some benefit if we treat this patient for longer um, compared to just treating them for just six weeks. We also found um, that there was a trend uh, towards decreasing T-selecting levels uh, with lots of evidence now that T-selecting plays a role in the adhesion process and contributes to vessel occlusion in patients with sickle cell disease. So this study was encouraging, but did not provide the answer. So the plan is to go do adequately powered studies going forward to see if we can adequately define the effect of equivastatin in sickle cell disease and um, related glomerulopathy. So I'll end by um, stating that there are a variety of ongoing clinical trials um, looking at uh, several drugs in sickle cell disease, uh, related kidney disease at this time. Uh, so there's a study looking at Rio uh, which is called the stereo SCD, looking at a variety of endpoints, uh, uh, but also includes um, albuminuria in patients with sickle cell disease. Uh, there's this study called the Steadfast study that's looking at the effect of crizanizumab plus standard of care uh, versus standard of care alone in patients who have sickle cell disease with kidney disease. So crizanizumab is an anti p selecting um, uh, antibody that's approved for treatment of, um, for reduction of frequency of painful crisis in patients with sickle cell disease. And so this study is ongoing at this time. Uh, there's also one study, a uh, little small study that's looking at the effect of voxolitol, which is a drug that modifies um, hemoglobin and causes a shift of the oxygen dissociation curve to the left uh, and decreases anemia in these patients. And so this study is going on to look at its effect on kidney disease as well. And then there's another study uh, which has been led by Pablo Bartolucci in, in France. at a placebo control study to evaluate the long-term effects of hydroxyurea um, um, on albuminuria and patients with sickle cell disease. So um, in summary, um, sickle cell disease is very common. Um, and chronic kidney disease is quite common in sickle cell disease and associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Uh, so we need to identify better tools to identify patients at high risk. Uh, I will add that uh, a variety of our colleagues are doing a variety of genetic studies to identify these patients as well. Uh, they are commonly treated with ACE inhibitors uh, or ARBs or hydroxyurea. Um, and uh, there's a need to perform adequately controlled studies and a variety of novel treatments are ongoing at this time as well. So I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues and I'll end right here. Thank you so much. So Ken, thank you for a wonderful presentation. For those of you in the audience, use the chat to uh, type in any questions that Ken will take at the end. And now we're going to go on to the presentation by Jane Hankins. Thank you. Ken, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yeah, yeah. thank you. All right. So thank you, Dr. Goodman, for the invitation to speak uh, in the Society for Experimental Biology and Medicine webinar series. And I am going to, okay. All right. And uh, I want to say that uh, Ken ended his talk perfectly for me because uh, one cannot expect outcomes in sickle cell disease to improve if we don't work on helping the patients take their treatments, take their medication. So you mentioned hydroxyurea as a treatment that is being investigated in sickle cell disease among others. And if we don't help patients stick with their regimen of taking the medicines, then you're not going to see improvement in their outcomes. Um, are my slides appearing correctly? You should flip. So, uh, you should flip the slides. Now they are correct? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. My disclosures, I received funding from the NIH, the CDC, Links and Corporate, Foundation, Global Blood Therapeutics, and also have consultancy fees from Bluebird Bio and Global Blood Therapeutics. So as an effort to support patients in improving their medication adherence, 
I am going to review the mobile health applications that have been developed in sickle cell disease. And specifically, the work that has been done to support medication adherence by demonstrating the evidence for efficacy and the new mobile health applications that are currently being developed and tested. And then what I see as the future of mobile health applications for medication adherence in sickle cell disease. So mobile health is the practice of medicine that is supported by mobile devices. And there are many applications of mobile health in medicine, for instance, uh, mobile health can help with access of clinical information, so access to the electronic health records through the use of patient portals, for example, that are available in, a patient, in patient cell phones. Uh, it can improve and support communication among healthcare providers through secure text messaging, also improve communication with patients, real-time monitoring of health through uh, sensors uh, and also uh, applications uh, that you use for um, monitoring pain and other symptoms. Also is a way to deliver remote health care, such as with the telemedicine, and also a way to deliver interventions, such as improvement in medication adherence and mental health. And why is mobile health uh, increasingly used in medicine to provide all types of services um, in medicine. The reason is because the use of internet and mobile devices is really prevalent, not only in uh, developed countries, but also has increased uh, in developing nations. This is uh, information from the Pew Research Center that shows the use of internet uh, in advanced economies, 80 to 87%. And this is data from almost three years ago, but also this nice increase in developing nations. Same thing for those who own a smartphone and use online social networking, which is another way to reach patients is through um, an, um, we'll call alternative uh, means of uh, using um, uh, social media, for example, for recruitment and delivery of treatment. So uh, it is mobile health as um, a platform for delivering treatment to support adherence, for example, or other uh, treatments in sickle cell disease is relatively new uh, and, uh, and also new for other chronic diseases. So I would say compared to other chronic diseases such as asthma, uh, diabetes, HIV, uh, the use of mobile health and sickle cell disease is still in the early phases. And uh, in 2008, uh, we uh, collected the data in the systematic review to uh, understand what was the landscape of mobile health and sickle cell disease. And we found only 16 publications uh, that met our criteria, which was is e-health, mobile health, used to improve self-management, which is the most common way uh, that mobile health is used, adherence, delivery of uh, mental health. And of those 16 publications, five of them were addressing adherence, and three of the five were specifically for the use of hydroxyurea. So I'm going to use hydroxyurea as an example here because it's where uh, mobile health has been mostly used and because hydroxyurea is considered today uh, standard of care and it is approved by the FDA for both children and adults. And why uh, is hydroxyurea considered standard of care? It's because the accumulated uh, years of experience uh, in the clinical trials in real world data that show that hydroxyurea uh, truly brings benefits in sickle cell disease. Uh, most of the knowledge relates to acute complications such as preventing acute chest syndrome events, uh, the use of blood transfusions for acute complications of sickle cell disease, uh, and reduces emergency visits and admissions to the hospital. So because of that, the NHLBI in 2014 issued guidelines for sickle cell disease and specifically recommended the use of hydroxyurea for both children and adults with sickle cell disease. 
In children, the recommendation was for all children with the genotypes of SS and S beta zero, which is uh, from um, Dr. Taga's presentation, the most severe, uh, typically considered the most severe pheno uh, phenotype of sickle cell disease. And then for adults, the recommendations are for those with more severe phenotype or pain crisis in a 12 month period. So this is all nice and groovy, except for hydroxyurea is not used as intended. This is a pooled analysis with over 8,000 patients using claims data with me, uh, primarily Medicaid that showed that in over 8,000 patients, mostly adults, it was only prescribed in half of those patients. Even though the MAP criteria for using hydroxyurea, it is low, and of those, only 38% of them actually initiated treatment. So they were prescribed, but they actually, but, but they didn't pick up the prescription and started treatment. And of those, only 15% of them had what we call ad adequate adherence, which in using real world data, the uh, measure that most approximates adherence is this measure called the medication possession ratio which doesn't equate adherence, but it just tells you that the patient is in possession of the drug. Uh, so we can take the medicine if it's not in possession. So if you're in possession of the drug for more than 80% of the days in a month or in a year, then we consider that um, acceptable adherence. And that's what uh, the, we use um, as the surrogate for adherence and also accepted by in the literature and the FDA. So I am going to illustrate how mobile health can be used uh, to um, support medication adherence uh, with the case of one of my patients. Um, um, this is a, a patient that I followed for um, her entire life until, uh, life until she became an adult. And she's actually now Dr. Ataga's patient. But um, this is an 18 year old uh, with hemoglobin SS when she was three years old. Uh, her parents requested that she initiated hydroxyurea. And this, these were very engaged and supportive parents. And she had excellent adherence to hydroxyurea. Her um, mean corpuscular volume increased by 25 femtoliters. And this is the nice graph that I'm showing on the, on the top. And her um, fetal hemoglobin responded well, increased, and then plateau around 20%. She did very well, and she had a couple of episodes of acute chest syndrome in childhood. But the problem was when she became an adolescent. So when she turned 13 years old, other things happened in her life too, uh, which included a change in her home environment when her parents got divorced and now the mother had uh, took a full-time job. Uh, and so the different um, changes um, in her life uh, probably led to this disengagement with her treatment. And as a consequence, she started experiencing more acute complications, acute chest syndrome and pain events. So at that point, when she was um, about 15 years old, we were just thinking about using um, mobile health to support medication adherence, except for that was uh, over 10 years ago and we did not have any sophisticated um, applications to give the patients. Uh, so we developed this um, very simple SMS uh, or text message um, application that came out of the St. Jude server. And uh, it's, we, we tested with the adolescents uh, as a pilot study and she was one of them. And uh, sure enough, uh, we did see an improvement in the medication um, in, in the in, in the um, the mean corpuscular volume after she started text messaging. So then we looked at the results of our text messaging in the uh, approximately 80, 90 adolescents with sickle cell disease who were using hydroxyurea. And what we saw was that when they started using the text message, there was a significant increase in the fetal hemoglobin as we saw a parallel increase in their medication possession ratio. Uh, and this work now is seven years old since we published, uh, but this is the very first 
evidence that mobile health in any format could improve medication adherence for hydroxyurea in sickle cell disease. Well, nice and groovy, except for the effect of text message, text message did not last. And that was disappointing to us. But at the same time, a lot of people um, were working, started working on mobile health. And it turns out that text message by itself are really not sufficient to keep the patient engaged. It is a very important element of uh, when delivering mobile health, but cannot be the only one. This is nice work by Sharif Badawi from Lurie Children's in Chicago that interviewed a number of adolescents and young adults, over 100 of them, and they clearly said, yes, text message, medication reminders are important, but I also want my application to have information about sickle cell disease, I want to learn about it, uh, I want to uh, be able to have a medication log. So. I want to be able to see my lab results so and receive positive feedback. So clearly, they wanted a more complex application, which did happen. Um, this is a um, publication by uh, our uh, colleagues at Duke University, Nirmish Shah, um, and this is a, the, the lead in this work that showed a, a multi-level application that has several features combined in, uh, in, 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 the, in the mobile health application for cell phones can indeed improve your medication possession ratio or your um, increased adherence. In parallel, the disease knowledge increases. So that's disease specific literacy, uh, which we think is an important component uh, in maintaining your adherence and your engagement with your treatment. Unfortunately, again, not everybody liked it, not everybody used it. And the, and the overall engagement was low. So 37% versus the goal that they had for the study, which was 75% of entries. And this was an application with several different things. They had selfies, they could take selfies, they could, they could communicate with their providers through the application. The application would send them motivation uh, messages. Uh, so I think this was a good attempt uh, at developing multi-level application that addressed the different needs of the patients. But um, I think what was lacking what was what this group did, which is really spending the time to understand uh, what are the needs uh, by using theoretical framework. So there's a lot of research on why don't you take the medication? Why is your adherence low? Uh, a lot of behavior theories that show if you're not ready for a change, if you're not considering the change, you're unlikely to improve your medication adherence. So uh, this is group from Ohio State that use grounded theoretical framework and then uh, the health behavior model uh, and used cues. Uh, self-efficacy, all elements of the health behavior model, and then uh, built in the applications for mobile health that directly map to one of those elements of the health behavior model. And what they saw in a small number of patients, 15 adolescents, there was an increase in the mincovascular volume and fetal hemoglobin. So they went on to study more patients, 55 patients in a prospective study. Uh, and again, there was an improvement in the medication possession ratio, but over a six month period, that medication possession ratio dropped it. So I think it was an incremental improvement. I think they uh, took the time to understand the reasons why you engage with a treatment, uh, but it was an improvement, but declined over time. This is a group from Germany that, uh, is attempting to the, it did develop this more sophisticated application also using behavior theory. What they use was the behavior change will as the framework uh, and then mapped, uh, they customized their application uh, using avatars. Uh, they're geared towards the children. So this is not only for adolescents, but also younger children uh, worked on the memory, which they identified as an important element of uh, low adherence and motivation, motivation and knowledge. So now you're starting to see some common themes that people are now in, uh, adding to their uh, multi-level mo mo mobile health applications. 
So back to our work here that uh, included only text message, uh, we really realized we have to expand and spend more time understanding the barriers to uh, using mobile health to improve medication adherence. So we um, applied for NIH funding and uh, received one of the eight um, U01 NIH funding uh, in implementation science to increase the translation of um, uh, evidence-based treatments into regular care for patients with sickle cell disease. And this was a new initiative from the NHLBI, the Sickle Cell Disease Implementation Consortium. And this in the picture, uh, the eight sites and the data coordinating center, which is RTI for the study. And what is implementation science? So it's really the methods and strategy to facilitate the uptake of evidence-based practice into regular care of patients. Um, and, and also improve uh, policy uh, it, it to support policymakers as they make uh, decisions about allocation of um, efforts and, uh, and money. So this is how we did it. This is how we studied uh, how do we increase, um, how do we use mobile health uh, to improve the use of hydroxyurea. So it's, it really cannot be at the patient level only. Uh, as I showed in the beginning, the providers weren't prescribing hydroxyurea, patients weren't even initiating it. So we had to really take a broader approach and focus on all the levels, all the multi-level barriers to hydroxyurea use. So at the patient level, uh, it, we develop a mobile health application that increases medication adherence, but at the provider level, we had to address the fact that they were not prescribing and why weren't they prescribing. So we really had to take the time to understand the factor, the effect, the factors affecting medication adherence among patients, and uh, the lack of prescribing among providers. So this is the work to develop the mobile health applications that we are testing uh, in a multi-center study right now as part of the implementation consortium. So we use what we call the user-centered design, uh, which is a methodology to um, develop a new product that uh, is developed with the with the end user. So you develop with and for the patients or for the users. And, uh, and, this, is, and, and this is the process that uh, we use to develop. We start with a design session uh, with all the users in the room. And, and we had investigators, clinicians, and patients uh, in a room. Uh, and then we really investigate the barriers and why uh, the hydroxyurea is not being taken. And then we took the step of surveying, interviewing the patients, and then we developed a prototype of the mobile health application that had all the things that the patients and the clinician told us that we should include. And then we tested uh, as a, a we beta test those prototypes and, to, and made more, um, more mod modifications to the app until we reached the final prototype, which looks like this. Uh, even the name was given by uh, the, the, the users and it's called In Charge Health. That's the name of our mobile health application. And it is multi-level and all the things that the application does uh, were uh, included based on patient preference and patient input and tested. So as an example, we do we did retain the text messaging uh, because memory was uh, one of the highest reasons why patients wouldn't take the medication. But also we are we have specific education about managing side effects of the drug. And also uh, one of the uh, features that we included was um, a feature that you can track your pain level a day and you can map, you, um, you can um, graph your pain versus your adherence. So this is to visually see that if you don't, uh, the relationship of not taking the medication and higher levels of pain. So that really has helped our patients to understand and maintain their um, adherence. And we use the health belief model as uh, our behavior theory to develop this mobile application that we did. Uh, every, every feature of the mobile health is mapped directly to one of the domains of the health belief model. So for example, the reminders, uh, which are part of the personalization 
uh, of the health belief model. Tracking uh, addresses the intrinsic motivation, personal influence, social support and education. So uh, really um, we, we mapped because we studied and took the time to understand why adherence uh, is low. And this is how we are testing this multi-center study. Uh, the, uh, pro the physician mobile health application, I won't have time to give you uh, much detail, but it is basically a tool to help the providers prescribe hydroxyurea. And we are using artificial intelligence through um, uh, 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 conversational um, uh, tool at uh, it, it, um, the chat box that the provider enters the patient um, scenario and the, the computer tells you the dose and how to adjust the dose. So that on the left, it's called a two toolbox. This is for providers and on the right is uh, how we're testing the patient app. And the study is called Integration Mobile Health into Sickle Cell Disease Care to Increase Hydroxy Utilization or the MASH study. And really how we're using it, uh, we're uh, using the one, so I think it's great to develop your mobile health uh, with patient input using, using user-centered design. And also very important to uh, use uh, behavior theories to understand the underpinnings of uh, non-adherence, but also you have to think about how you, you study it, how you insert and integrate mobile health into the day-to-day flow of how you treat your patients is what I like to call the ecosystem of care. So this is how we are testing it. The, the study that we, we consent the patient, the patient use, downloads the app and uses it. Can uh, Inside the app, they can access the patient portal and look at their labs. It's one of the things the patients requested. And then they get the daily reminders and then they see the physician in clinic uh, who then uses their own app to learn how to prescribe hydroxyurea, sends the prescription through e-prescribe to the pharmacy, the patient picks it up and takes it. So it's really, inserted into the ecosystem. So I think I encourage people when they develop mobile health is to really think how am I going to integrate the use of mobile health into the day-to-day -day? because if it's an extraneous factor, it's not going to be adopted. So you really have to think how to make that part of an or your organic function um, of, your, of, of your program. So where do you go from here? We go from here with mobile health for sickle cell disease. So I think uh, the sophistication of the mobile health application has increased significantly. With every mobile health application that is developed, you have more and more sophisticated features. Uh, you have AI now um, as part of the of mobile health, for example. But I think what needs to happen more and more is full system integration. And what do I mean about that? Uh, the mobile health applications have to talk and connect with everything else that you use. So the mobile health applications that we are testing right now is not integrated to the EHR. You do connect to the patient portal, but that's not completely integrated. So you need to be able to, for example, prescribe your app the way you prescribe medication, for example, which is, which is called digital prescribing. So the full system integration uh, is uh, the direction that I see mobile health applications being developed. The other thing is that I'm not sure mobile health applications uh, work by themselves. I see them more as a, um, more as a support to the clinician. So uh, there are studies out there, they are picking up on that idea that uh, you really have to think about a blended model of digital and human directed approaches. Uh, this is uh, work by uh, Nancy Green in New York uh, that uses community health workers and text messages to increase medication adherence. I think it's a great idea. Uh, and also uh, folks from, um, I think um, Norway, uh, no, uh, uh, Switzerland, uh, they are uh, testing this uh, a very clever AI um, conversational, uh, it's a chat, it's a coach, uh, it's an artificial coach that they uh, developed uh, in there and they tested and they published recently uh, for, uh, it's in French, uh, but it's um, um, an application that walks the patients through what to do depending on their symptoms. And that's also supposed to help you with adherence. 
So in conclusion, mobile health solutions can be useful tools to improve the medication adherence for sickle cell disease. I think we have uh, a lot yet to learn about uh, what needs to be in the application, what is it gonna connect you to, and what all is it gonna do? Uh, and also I think it needs to account for the patient context. So you cannot develop mobile health application without understanding where the patients are and what the patients want in the application customized to the population. Uh, and, and it cannot be used by itself. If you wanna address medication adherence, you have to think about all the multi-level barriers that affect the medication adherence. Uh, incorporate the perception and preferences of your patient and think about new functionality. Uh, for example, integration with other systems, as I said, and you know the fancy applications that are used now. Uh, I think that's uh, probably the direction of mobile health is going. So thank you uh, and I'll be happy to take questions. So thank you very much, Jane, for <clears throat> a wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you both, thank you, Ken, as well. And I think it's time for us to take questions. So Jess, what sure. do we have? We have a number in our chat. And just a reminder, anyone watching on Facebook, we're also taking questions. You can just leave those in the comments. The first one uh, for Ken, what is the relationship of sickle cell disease to diabetes and kidney disease? So, um, not clear that there's a direct relationship between diabetes and sickle cell disease except that both can cause, both diabetes and sickle cell disease can affect the kidneys, right? Um, so what we have shown is that in individuals who have the less severe phenotypes, so hemoglobin SC disease and um, sickle beta plus thalassemia, um, traditional risk factors, so um, high blood pressure and history of diabetes do seem to be associated with a higher risk of decline in kidney function, at least in univariate analysis. Um, so I'm not aware that anyone has studied the combination, but intuitively it makes sense that if you have two bad things, things could get worse, right? So um, um, when I have patients who have sickle cell disease and diabetes, uh, not only do I want to manage their sickle cell disease adequately, I always make sure that they are aggressively controlling their blood sugars, you know, because um, again, like I said, a variety of diabetes complications um, um, are shared with sickle cell disease, so not just the kidney, but also eye complications and things like that. So, um, so, so yeah, so that's the link in my mind. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one for Jane. What is the relationship of adherence to age groups in large cohort studies? Yeah, so um, thanks, Dr. Vieman, for the question. So uh, two things. One is uh, we know that the, in the adolescent and young adult age groups, so the AYA population, um, a lot of things go wrong. Uh, a lot of research done in health risk behavior and um, lack of uh, maturation in the AYA population and a strong relationship with poor adherence. So, um, and if you're a clinician, you, you relate to this, uh, your young, your patient is a young child, and then like my patient becomes an adolescent and young adult and parents drops, and then picks up later, 30, 30 something. So the AYA population is really high risk. And a lot of the interventions are geared towards that specific population. Now in large cohort studies, it has not really been studied uh, very much. So mobile health is not one of the interventions that has been um, studied in large cohort studies um, because it's a new um, intervention. And so I think uh, as we get better at, uh, at uh, getting data, so EHR data that is uh, repurposed, repurposed to uh, research, so real world data, I think uh, uh, and if we can um, reach the goal of linking to mobile health data, I think we'll be able to understand the role of mobile health at a large, um, a large scale. Thank you. We have uh, one more for uh, Dr. Ataga. Is there any evidence of prevention of organ damage by ACE inhibitors in sickle cell disease and what may be their potential effects on blood pressure in these patients? So that's a good question. So, um, so for one, we use ACE inhibitors or ARBs in patients, at least typically at this point. We use them only in patients when they already have evidence of organ damage. So when they already have kidney disease, manifest as albuminuria. And so in short-term studies, uh, so these medicines can decrease 
and apnea that patients have. Um, so whether these medications can prevent the onset of albuminuria, which will be decreasing um, organ damage is not clear at this point because that's not been done. Uh, with regards to the effects of um, uh, these medications on um, blood pressure, um, so the data is not very strong one way or the other. So there are no big studies that have been done just yet, but there have been a variety of small studies. So the very first study uh, was done by my former chair when I was at UNC, one fork. And they treated patients with um, um, ACE inhibitors, so enalapril, for two weeks. And in that study, so they were able to show a decrease in, um, in proteinuria, uh, but did not show any significant changes in blood pressure in that study. Uh, but there's been other small studies, one using capripril, uh, where they showed decrease in, uh, in albuminuria and some mild decreases in um, blood pressure. Uh, I would say that in my clinical experience, most patients don't have it any meaningful drop in their blood pressure, uh, although that's something to always be concerned about because it's a blood pressure medicine, so in theory, you can drop the blood pressure, but that's not something we typically see uh, patients having uh, blood pressure drop in this medication. Thank you so much. That's all we have in the chat. Uh, oh, one more coming in. Uh, I'd like to know if Dr. Ataga made the follow-up of cholesterol levels together with the use of uh, like you can read that, Dr. Chen, and correlated it with the kidney alter alteration with inflammation markers. So, um, so we did measure cholesterol levels, and there were some decreases in cholesterol with use of etrovastatin, uh, like you would expect. Um, we did not look for any relationship because we didn't really see any decrease in in um, in, in albuminuria or anything like that. So we did not pursue that. Um, but perhaps if we do like long term studies. And we do see a decrease in abnormal. We'll, we'll do that, but that's a good, that's a good question. Yes, right. I think Aku Sugunyami is asking, how do I access the app? Uh, thank you for the question, um, uh, Aku Sua. So we're um, testing the app in the multi-center study. So uh, until we finish the um, uh, the clinical trial, we're not distributing the app yet. So, uh, and it's NIH funded, so it's going to be available for free, of course. Uh, so um, probably uh, this time next year, we'll make it available. Uh, you'll be on the app store and Google Play. Wonderful. I'm not seeing any other comments, but of course, if you have questions, uh, let let us know and we can pass your information um, and questions along to today's speakers and I'm sure they can follow up with you after the event. And um, otherwise, I'd love to invite all of you to join us next week uh, for our final webinar in our sickle cell disease series. And that's all from me. If uh, anybody has any questions, feel free to email me at ed at sebm.org and I can uh, help you out with any, any follow-up issues. And I want to thank uh, both Ken and Jane. Wonderful presentations. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all so much and have a lovely day. Thank so you. So long. Good day. Thank you.